Just stand and join us as we sing together. Shine like the sun. 
digging deep to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. Many, many announcements today, so uh, just, um, I, I said I was going to need a pen to check all of them off because there are so many of them, um, some even from this morning. Um, if you, for, uh, we need a few good men to help after church uh, to move a carpet that's downstairs, and so if you could just uh, see me after uh, the service, uh, Michael Fitzpatrick uh, has uh, needs some help with something. Uh, to move this carpet, and so I encourage you to, uh, to stay and help for that. Uh, also, if you grab your bulletin, there's several announcements in there. Um, first of all, there, uh, we're in need of some volunteers for the cafe, for the morning cafe prior to Sunday school, and there's information that is there. Uh, you can see Marge Moyer. If you uh, have more questions, Marge, if you could raise your hand to see Marge, and she will give you all of the information uh, that you need for that. Also in there, there is a flyer uh, that is advertising both our dinner that is this Thursday evening at 5.30 p.m., as well as the Easter service that we will have next Sunday. Next Sunday morning is Resurrection Sunday, and uh, time to celebrate the Lord's resurrection uh, along with the, the entire world that recognizes uh, the reality of what occurred those many years ago. But we also need to pass these out into the community. So if you are available today at 2 p.m., we'd encourage you to join with us. We'll just take an opportunity. Um, we're not going to go and knock on every door, but just uh, stick them in the door uh, or there on their, on their stoop and leave them there for the people to invite them uh, to our Thursday evening dinner as well as to our Easter uh, service. We will also be having a Good Friday service this Friday at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary, time of communion and time of reflecting on uh, the crucifixion of our Savior, and so encourage you uh, to come to that time, a time just to meditate on scriptures as we look at the seven last 
words of Jesus on the cross and, uh, and think through the impl implications of that for our lives uh, as well. And then there's also um, just a, a reminder that if you are a first-time visitor, there is a, a card that's in the pocket in front of you there in the pew. Uh, you have an opportunity to fill out your information and place it in the offering boxes that are in the back of the sanctuary, encourage you to do that. If you have a prayer request or if there's any information uh, that you would like to relay, there's an opportunity on the back side of that to fill that out as well and place it in the offering box. And we'll make sure to, uh, to get those prayer requests and to lift those before the Lord. Uh, let me see if I've hit every announcement. I think I have. Um, if not, uh, you may have another special service announcement in the service, but uh, let's stand right now and greet one another as we continue our time together.
we chant the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. And you are the only king forever. Mighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever. Forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Our scripture this morning is taken from Matthew 21, verse 1 through 11. And while you're looking for that, if you'd like to look for it, <coughs> I'm remembering a truth that I've learned years ago. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Amen. But verse 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them. And he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, me. Say to the Lord of, pardon me, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you humble, mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and put on them their cloaks. And he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Praise God. Praise Amen. God.
we are so grateful that your son came to this earth and lived the perfect life for us, that we can have eternity with you in heaven. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this Palm Sunday where we can celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Just let me pray. Amen. You may be seated. Children ages three years old through fifth grade are dismissed for their classes. We'll give them a minute to get out the door and we'll pray together. And we've been um, praying a lot of scripture together lately. And I've been thinking about um, this psalm, Psalm 16, um, especially with uh, Brother Don's service on uh, Friday. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll pray this together. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. God, I pray that you would build in our hearts and our church um, just a love and a, a desire and a passion for the saints, um, for those of us here together, for, um, for this church, that we would just take joy in one another um, with everything that we've been experiencing in our body. Um, God, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm really thankful for the hearts of, of the people in this church. Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after other gods. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. God, I pray that um, sin and strife and the idols of this world would be far from us, would be far from our lips but that your name would ever be on our lips, that um, as we're gathered here this morning to worship you together as a church, um, we would, throughout our days, throughout our weeks, we would um, be your body together and we would draw together in your name. Oh Lord, you are my portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. God, I, I think about this for my life, but um, again, I'm thinking about this for our church as well. That you are sovereign over all things and that everything that we go through um, when we walk in faith is, is your plan, is your desire to refine us to grow us, to teach us, to sanctify us. I pray that in everything that we go through, um, Rose and her trips in and out of the hospital, um, the other um, you know, medical needs that I know we're praying for, long-term diagnoses, um, things that uh, some of us, um, if you will, will live with for the rest of our days on earth, but we pray for your grace to sustain us. We pray for your mercy for um, even diagnoses um, that medically, naturally, there's no answer to, there's no cure for. God, you, um, you can cure, you can heal. But... I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart, our heart, God, is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. 
you will show me the path of life. And in your presence, as we're gathered here in your presence, in the name of Jesus together, his fullness of joy. Um, God, we do have joy together. You, um, 2,000 years ago, went into Jerusalem, going to your death, knowing what you would face. You faced ridicule and shame and separation from the Father. But you rose again so that we could have pleasures at your right hand forevermore. And I pray that as we go through this season with everything that, that we are going through individually, that we're going through together, um, that you would put that joy in our hearts. That you would um, bring us closer to, to one another in the name of Jesus, um, underneath your banner of truth and love and grace, um, that we would be a light to this community um, this week um, for the, uh, the community dinner as we go into um, Easter and our services um, to celebrate and to rejoice and to testify about your resurrection and the forgiveness of sins and um, joy and life ever everlasting at your right hand. Amen. There are two public service announcements. As I mentioned, there might be. I, do, I don't believe I mentioned there is a sunrise service at, at King's Gap at 7 a.m. next Sunday morning, Easter morning. I will be uh, presenting the morning message there. Um, that doesn't give you an excuse not to be here at 1030, but uh, just to uh, let you know that that is, um, is happening. And then also there is no Sunday school next Sunday, so I just wanted to make note of that as well. Uh, so that you can make plans uh, for that, but no Sunday school uh, next Sunday morning. I uh, encourage you to look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, as we're looking at uh, this Palm Sunday passage. Uh, we don't always uh, focus on uh, Palm Sunday, and we don't often preach this passage. In fact, I think the only time I ever hear these passages preached is on Palm Sunday, um, but to wrestle with what is the significance of this passage, um, what's, what's going on here in, in this moment of time during the Passion Week of our Savior, and what, what does it mean for us? Why was it important for Jesus to have a triumphal entry? Why did he choose to ride on a colt? What were the crowds thinking as they shouted, Hosanna, literally, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, the Son of David. Uh, I'm reminded often of a book that I read an, a number of years ago, uh, but, but one that has come to mind often, particularly at the beginning of the book, uh, by Philip Yancey, The Jesus I Never Knew. And he, he wrote this book because he was he was talking about the reality of growing up in the church and hearing these stories all throughout his life growing up and as an adult re-examining these passages and seeing things and understanding things that he had heard over and over and over again but never really had that type of impact on him or aspects of some of these stories that he just missed the significance of. And there are oftentimes stories that we hear in the Bible uh, that occurred that we've heard so many times from the time we were in Sunday school as little children uh, all the way up to adulthood, and they become so familiar that sometimes we don't pause to uh, ask questions or to, to examine things. And so uh, there's no fast forwards. Now, I think about this too as I as I, I read through the Bible regularly, and you read stories and you know how it ends. You know what happens next. You know the resolution of it. But imagine being there in the moment and just you don't know what's going to happen next. You know, you think of the apostles uh, when they were going through this this week. 
Jesus had told them multiple times that he was going to die, that he was going to be put to death, that he was going to give his life as a ransom for many. And yet, as these events were unfolding, they, they still questioned and wondered and, and tried to piece it together. They, they wondered, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to establish your kingdom? They didn't understand what the kingdom was going to look like. They couldn't put all of the pieces of it, pieces of it together. Uh, when, when they were in the garden and uh, Jesus was betrayed and they didn't understand the full significance of that and the fulfillment of prophecy and how God had sovereignly chosen to use this in order to bring Jesus to the cross. Even after his resurrection, they, they still didn't understand all of the significance of it. And I think when we read these stories, we miss the emotional impact of it as it was happening, as it was going on, and thinking, what, what was it like to be one of those people in that crowd this day and seeing all of this unfolding? What would you be thinking? How would you respond? And it's our tendency to kind of jump to the end of the story because we know how it unfolds. And we forget that the people, as they were going through this, they had no certainty of how things were going to end. And so I'd like for us just to slow down and, and think through uh, these events and to wrestle with the significance of it. Let me give you a little bit of a background of what is happening uh, just prior to this. Um, a few weeks before, Jesus uh, had raised Lazarus from the dead. That's recorded in John, uh, John's Gospel in chapter 11. And, and many of the people there were amazed at this occurrence and the Pharisees had doubled down on their plot to kill Jesus. And then briefly, he tours Samaria and Galilee, the story of him healing the ten lepers that we find in Luke chapter 17. Um, he shares two parables on prayer. We see that in Luke chapter 18. Um, in, he teaches on divorce and on children. We see that recorded in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, we remember the story of the rich young ruler that we find in Luke chapter 18 and Jesus teaching on servant leadership in, recorded in Matthew 20. He, he heals two blind men also recorded in Matthew 20. And the, the incident of Zacchaeus being converted. You remember Zacchaeus, the wee little man? Uh, that, that's found in Luke chapter 19 and that's right before this. Uh, he teaches about money. On Saturday before the Passion Week, Jesus is again uh, visits Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And that's when Mary anoints Jesus for his burial. Uh, the second time that he, he was anointed. Martha serves while Lazarus reclines with Jesus. And we, we read these things that precede what we find here in Matthew chapter 21. And so we find in verses 1 through 7 that Jesus prepares to present himself as Messiah. And let me just read again the first five verses. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Imagine being those disciples, and you get these instructions. How would you respond? Now, they didn't know what was going to happen. They trusted Jesus, uh, but they didn't know what was going on. Did Jesus set this up in advance? Was, there, was this a secret code that, uh, that Jesus had given to them so that when it occurred, they would know what, uh, what to do? They might have wondered, well, what happens if we don't succeed? What happens if we don't come back with this, with this cult? What, what if we get in trouble? They don't know the arrangements and they don't know the outcome, but they're faithful to Christ's commands. Jesus had told them to do this. 
And as we read this, we find it, it occurs exactly as Jesus had said in verse 6. It says, The disciples went out and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. It worked out exactly as Jesus had said. Now, some people wonder that perhaps Jesus had uh, previously arranged this, and, and that's why it occurred exactly as Jesus had said. I, I think personally that because Jesus is both fully God and fully man, he knew exactly uh, what was going to happen. He uh, is omniscient. He knew that the animals would be there, and he knew that they would respond exactly as he had said. And so he, he sent them uh, to do this task. But it also shows us that what happened next was an intentional uh, fulfillment of prophecy, that uh, Jesus here intentionally fulfills the prophecy that we see uh, recorded here in verse 5. Jesus reveals himself as the, the Messiah. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says this, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, until now, Jesus was hesitant to openly reveal who he was. Um, you remember in John chapter 4, he first revealed who he was to the woman at the well. Uh, there in, in Samaria, uh, he encounters this woman at the well, and he reveals to her that uh, he is, in fact, the one who is to come. Uh, in John chapter 7, verses 40 through 45, there's a, a great disagreement about his identity and, and who is this one uh, that's to come. Uh, we see that again in John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I and the Father am one. And he, again, uh, says who he is. In Matthew chapter 16, we remember Peter's confession. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they, they, they give a, a number of names, and then he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers with that great confession that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one that God was going to send, the anointed one. And he says that flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And Peter gives this, this great confession of who Jesus is. Well, why did Jesus ride on a colt? Uh, one Luke notes um, that the, the ass was the mount of a man of peace. Now, a military leader would come on a war horse. Uh, when a king was coming in victoriously, uh, he would come on a war horse, but, but riding, as it were, on this colt, it was a living illustration, it was a dramatic sermon that the anointed one who was coming was coming as a man of peace, that the son of David was coming as a man of peace. And so then we see next how the crowd responds in verses 10 and 11. Uh, it says, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, there, there would have been a mixed multitude here. And again, imagine being in this crowd. Now, some of those people there had likely seen Lazarus a few weeks before being raised from the dead that they had seen something that had occurred that, that, that none of them ever would have experienced or even imagined in their lives. And now here is this one, this Jesus, who's coming in to Jerusalem. There would have been travelers from Galilee who were there. And there would have been Jews who were from Jerusalem. And then there would have just been people who were curious. Maybe people who hadn't necessarily followed the ministry of Jesus or hadn't even heard of him. But now, as there's this uproar and this crowd, that they're caught up in the midst of it and they're watching all of these things unfold. And so there was a mixed multitude there of, of people who were watching these events unfold. 
the crowd begins to praise God and exalt Jesus. Now, there were some, as I said, that were, that were just curious. They didn't maybe know all of the details or hadn't followed the ministry of Christ closely. They saw the excitement and they wanted to join in. Some of them may have just been looking for the experience of going along for the ride. Now, I, I don't think, and again, there were probably some here at this event that were later when Christ was being betrayed who along with the, uh, were stirred up by the leaders to cry out, crucify, and there, there were probably some, at least a few who were here that would have been at that other event. I don't think necessarily that most of them were both here and at uh, the time when Christ was betrayed and the crowds were stirred up during his trial to crucify him, but there would have been some who were there. I think also there were some that were zealously misguided. Uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, were upset at Jesus, and, and they thought, and we saw this with Paul as well when he was a Pharisee, um, that, that they thought they were on the right side by persecuting Jesus and wanting to put him to death. When these, when these people cry out, they tell him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answers, I tell you, if these are silent, the stones will cry out. One of my professors, Dr. Ray Ludwigson, he gave three rules of interpretation, and I just want to focus on, on the last of the three, but I'll share all three of them. Uh, he says, read the Bible book in one sitting, and we've talked about this before, that you read the Bible in one sitting, the Bible book, in order to get an overview, and sometimes that may be just five or ten minutes. If it's a very small book, it could be an hour or longer if it's a larger book, but the idea is to get the context of the entire book as you're reading it uh, so that you can see not just the parts but the whole and see how they all fit together. And then he would often tell us to let the author speak. You know, when Matthew tells you what's happening, let Matthew speak. And uh, don't read into what it says. Um, don't ignore what it says, but let the author speak. But then his third point would be this. No preconceived notions. That's how he would put it. No preconceived notions. In, in other words, don't come in with your own ideas already made up of how things are supposed to be. Uh, because what happens is when you come in with preconceived ideas, it can blind you to what's really there. If you think this should fit this way and you read something that actually challenges what you're thinking, you're, you're apt to, to misinterpret it or to ignore it or to, to reinterpret it to fit into your preconceived ideas. And for many of the Jews of, of this day and even the disciples of Christ at this time, they had some preconceived ideas about the Messiah. They believed that the Messiah was supposed to come. And when the Messiah came, it was going to be during this time of tribulation, this time of, of upheaval. And Elijah would come as the forerunner. But what they believed about the Messiah and Jesus didn't fit their preconceived ideas. Because they believed when the Messiah came, he was going to come as a conquering king on a war horse to, to gather the people together and to overthrow those who were oppressing them and to establish his kingdom forever. And we, we see this even with the disciples, even after Jesus rises from the dead in the, in the book of Acts. They say, well, they, they, okay, you died and you rose again. Now is it now that you're going to establish your kingdom? They were waiting for this physical, material kingdom. And the people who were looking for a Messiah during this time weren't looking for a, uh, the Prince of Peace. They weren't looking for a suffering servant. They weren't looking for somebody who was going to give his life as a ransom for many. They were looking for somebody who was going to come and conquer as a king on a war horse. And here is the Messiah coming into town, riding on a colt as the Prince of Peace who was going to come and sacrifice himself. He was going to be humiliated. He was going to be mocked. He was going to be paraded through the streets and hung on a cross in humiliation. 
And he was going to die and be buried. And this was not the Messiah that they were expecting and they were looking for. The Messiah was going to come and totally destroy and smash the enemy. Jerusalem was going to be renovated. Palestine would be the center of the world. And because of all these assumptions, many of them could not see the Messiah right in front of them. They had so many preconceived ideas of how things were going to be that they couldn't see what actually was. And there's a, there's a danger for us as well that we can have preconceived ideas of who Jesus is and what his role is. Uh, we, we see this around the world that Jesus is reinterpreted in a variety of ways. We don't accept the Jesus of the Bible. We have the Jesus that we refashion to fit our agenda. Uh, we have Jesus the socialist. There are, are some who reinterpret the Bible and they see uh, Jesus a, as this one who is going to come and his concern is to uh, help the oppressed and the poor. Uh, Jesus the businessman or Jesus the freedom fighter or Jesus the mystic or Jesus the Republican or Jesus the Democrat. I remember Tony Evans years ago, he, he made the comment that, you know, Jesus does not come riding uh, on the back of an elephant or a donkey, but he actually did, but that's not <laughs> political. I get his point, but his point is, is Jesus didn't come in, in, in order to be a politician, now, I, I have to admit, there's a danger, and I, it's, it's more of a danger now than I think I've, I've ever seen it in, in 30 years of ministry, of the church becoming political. The church is not a political action committee. Our, our leader is not in Harrisburg or Washington, D.C. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, seated on his throne and we bow our heads and our hearts to him. And our allegiance is first to him and to him alone. And that every, every person, every politician, every political party must be evaluated in light of the reality of God's word. And so... Uh, we have to be careful that we don't have our own assumptions. I, I, I don't know how many discussions in the last decade that I've gotten into that, that weren't related on what does Scripture say, what did Jesus say and the Bible said, but what does a political party say or what does a movement say? And so we have to be careful that, that we don't have preconceived ideas of what the Bible does and doesn't say. And what the Bible's priorities are. Because we can read into it just as much as they did. Maybe in different ways, but it's very easy for us to do. And so we, as much as possible, have to set aside our preconceived ideas. We have to ask God to, to, to open our eyes to see what the text really says. To see what God has done. And what he calls us to do and who he calls us to be. And that his priorities are our priorities. And so we have to be careful that we don't have preconceived ideas of, what, of who Jesus is and what the Bible teaches. You know, Jesus, the, the, that he was just a wise man or a social reformer. The faithful followers of Christ follow Jesus for who he was and who he is. And they desired to worship him. And although they were imperfect and sometimes fickle, they followed him. And they didn't always get it right, but they were willing to continue to seek after God and let God continue to open their eyes to understand more and more. We see this with the disciples as they wrestled with the reality of Christ's crucifixion. When he was being betrayed, they scattered, and most of them didn't come back until after the resurrection. And they wrestled with the meaning of it and understanding it and putting it together. 
But they followed Christ, and they were faithful. And as we look at this passage and we wrestle with, well, what was it like to be in that crowd? Think of all of the different viewpoints and all of the pressure to follow uh, one attitude or another, one idea or another. And, and we face that same type of pressure today to, to reinterpret what we believe in light of the latest ideas. But our responsibility is to see Jesus for who he is, that he, he was the suffering servant that came to sacrifice his life, but he is also the conquering king. This is what they missed. That he was both. That in his first advent, he came as the suffering servant to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for sin so that all those who turn to him in faith will have eternal life and become a part of his kingdom that was inaugurated at his first coming. But that he is coming again as the conquering king to right every wrong and to establish his kingdom forever. And that is the Jesus that we worship. And so as we come to the beginning of this week, as we recognize Palm Sunday, may we look anew and afresh at Jesus for who he is and recognize him as the Messiah, the Anointed One that came to save us from our sins and to bring us peace. The Jews missed the significance of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And the crowds were a mixed multitude, uncertain of Jesus' identity. But we too, by our familiarity with this story, may miss its power and its impact. And so I want to challenge you during this this week leading up to Easter to take some time to examine the life of Jesus, to examine the events of this week, to slow down and to look and to meditate on the reality of what Jesus did and why he did it. And so as we come to Good Friday and we remember his death, we see the significance of why he hung on the cross and those words and how they still resonate today. And then we come to Sunday morning. And every, every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection, but we, as a culture and around the world, we pause once a year to to particularly recognize the resurrection. And so we have an opportunity next week uh, to focus particularly on that. But I want to encourage you this week to slow down and to just look at the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, especially this final week that we find in the gospel accounts. Let's pray. Jesus, we bow our heads and our hearts to you. We come to you on your terms to recognize you for who you are, not who we want you to be. Uh, Lord, we we ask you to enable us to set aside our preconceived ideas that we don't bring you down uh, to some political agenda or personal agenda, or that we don't focus on something that is uh, not primary. But Lord, you came setting aside your glories to live a perfect life and to die on the cross and to rise again for us and for our sin so that your kingdom might be established forever. And so, Lord, I pray for us that we will have time, that we will make time to spend with you, that we might examine new and afresh the reality of this week. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
you if you can help for a few minutes after the service in uh, moving this carpet we'd appreciate you uh, doing that also if you can help at 2 p.m. Uh, to pass out uh, flyers again uh, we would greatly appreciate that if you're able to help on Thursday or to donate uh, any desserts there's a sign up in back uh, that you can fill out as well so that we uh, have an idea of who is, is going to be bringing things or is going to be here uh, encourage you to do that as well uh, receive now the benediction of the Lord, uh, the, the commissioning of the church that we find at the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so then he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen.